God, we're praying now for you to give us greater hope. When I look at my own capabilities, I wonder how things are going to work. I look at my resources and doubt if you really can use me. Your word teaches us to trust in you with all of our heart, to lean not on our own understanding. So in this moment, I pray that we would live for something bigger than ourselves. Help us to live generously, that we would find hope and purpose as we follow where you are leading. I pray that my family will follow you just as desperately as I do, that they wouldn't live for the fleeting passions of the world, but that they would seek you with all of their heart. I remember what life was like before following you, and God, I don't want to go back to how it was then. You've already done so much for us and through us, and somewhere between then and now, our closed fists became raised hands, our walking became running, our apathy became fire, and all the dead foliage that was on us now burns bright for you. We're walking in the joy of your promises, now that we have chosen to live in trust and generosity. Somewhere between then and now, you've changed us from the inside out. And we believe you'll do it again. Provide for us now, God. We are believing and praying for greater miracles. In Jesus' name, amen. I am excited about this message. And um, maybe excitement is not the best word. You'll see when I get It is. It's a good word. But this is a powerful message given by Jesus Christ himself. Like he's literally going to walk you and I through a story, a parable, that has an interesting start. Actually, two interesting starts, as I'm going to point out to you here in the scriptures. So in Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21, we're going to read it. I'm going to pull out some things for you. I want you to underline them. What we're going to look at today is how to be wise with your wealth. Now, I'm going, to I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say it confidently because the scriptures display it confidently. The Bible strongly attaches the fruit of belonging to Christ as having an attitude of generosity. In other words, it's very clear from Jesus' teachings, like we said over 2,600 times, almost four to one, Jesus spoke on this topic. I've said, this, I've said it this way every Sunday. If you can get this one area of your life right, most all other areas begin to fall into place where they need to fall into place. In other words, it's virtually impossible to be a close follower of Christ and not have an attitude of generosity. Because this is what Jesus points out here. And so he literally is going to uh, accidentally, not by, Jesus never does anything accidentally, but it's going to look that way to the crowd. You'll see what I mean in just a moment. He uses a moment to give a story that demonstrates how to be wise with your wealth. Look at verse 13. So someone in the crowd said to him, and that's an interesting start. So hang on, okay, let me just, before we got to stop right there. So Jesus obviously has now gathered a crowd, and he's, taught, he's already been teaching like two, three little mini sermons, if you will. And all of a sudden, some guy takes a moment, like when Jesus catches his breath, literally from verse 12 to verse 13. Of course, Jesus wasn't speaking by verses. You know that. But this, is, this sort of demonstrates a pause that was in his teaching time. Some guy in the middle of the crowd, like imagine if we're in here this morning, and all of a sudden when I take a pause, somebody stands up and asks me to give them advice on a legal situation their family's facing. That's exactly what this guy does. He hears Jesus teaching on so many topic, topics. He's familiar with who he is enough that he now says, you're such a man of influence. I want your opinion on this. Truth be known, the way he propositions the question, he really doesn't want sort of Jesus' opinion. He wants his voice of weight of leverage behind it to help him already make the decision he's already made. Now, I want you to know, you got to understand the scene here. There's a crowd that's gathered. This man now stands up. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Well, you know what he just came from. He came from a legal dispute where he's been asking the judge, like, my father has passed, and there's clearly a will. There's an inheritance. My brother's not willing to do what was stated to be done. I want your voice to tell him what I think should be done. Listen to Jesus' response. This is in front of a crowd. But he said to him, man, who made you a judge or arbitrator over you? In other words, Jesus is, is saying, I'm not here 
to help you get property. I'm here to bring you to the Father. Now, you had to know at that moment, the way Jesus answered him, you had to have known like that was a stern response. Almost like a teacher looking at a student who stood up in class and they were out of line. Jesus looked at him and said, I, who do you think made me arbitrator for you on your behalf? I'm not here to decide that legal position. In other words, sit down, know your place. I mean, this is how strongly Jesus taught this. And now Jesus takes this opportunity. Look at verse 15. And he said to them... So now he's using, the tone is, now he's using what this man propositioned about inherited goods and acquired goods on earth to now go into a story to demonstrate what should our approach be toward wealth. And he said, underline these next two words, take care. Now I'm in the ESV. Underline those two words, take care. Now underline this, this next phrase, and be on your guard. Okay, we, we can't even get into the message until you understand. First, the tone, the attitude of Jesus is talking to a crowd. Someone stands up and says, offer your opinion on a decision I've already made that will help the judge weigh in on what I think should happen. Jesus basically says, I'm not here to bring you property. I'm here to bring you to Christ. But now that you've brought that up, let me tell you how you should approach property. Now, why do I have you point out those words? Those words, take care and be on guard, are two different ways of saying beware. They're like flashing yellow lights. So the tone that Jesus is taking here, listen, this first word, take care, when he says that, when he looks at the, when he looked at the man and he says, here's, what I need, here's a man that came to me and he asked this question. The first phrase, take care, means you need to see this with your eyes and with your mind. It's a warning that goes out. Like these are strong words. They would have understood that. The tone and the posture that Jesus took, almost like a father that was sitting down with one of his sons or daughters, have you ever been there, that was about to drive and go to a place that was not safe. And he says to them, listen to me. Where you were about to go is not safe. And I need you to see this, and I need you to understand this. That's all in those two words, take care. And then he uses the phrase, be on guard. Now, this phrase, be on guard, first of all, he says, beware. You need to understand where you're headed. Because number two, be on guard, it literally means be on guard so you're not snatched away. And what is he talking about? He's talking about greed. He's talking about the opposite of generosity. Do you understand that generosity is the antithesis, antithesis to everything the culture throws at us? Greed is the opposite of generosity. Like wealth, if you will, this prosperity gospel is the opposite of what it means to be found rich in Christ. Serving, that's why I mentioned that serving opportunity. Serving is the opposite of gathering or gaining or self-help. It's giving yourself away. Everything about generosity is the opposite of what our culture proposes. And this man standing up in the attitude in which he did, tell me, Tell the judge, rather, to make a decision that is in my favor. Jesus wants, I'm going to say this so many times, Jesus has said, I am not here to bring you property. I am not here to bring you money. I am here to bring you into a relationship with Jesus Christ. But now that you've said that, he says, listen, beware. You need to see this teaching on generosity. Because if you don't understand this, greed will quickly overtake you and it will snatch you away. If you don't get that, you will totally miss the very last sentence of this story that Jesus reads. Because he uses this opener and this closer, if you will, as bookends with the message sandwiched right in the middle. And we're just in the first verse. He said, to him, take care, be on guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. How often does the world think that, right? He who dies with the most toys wins kind of a thing? No. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall... Underline the word I. The word I. I do. For underline I. For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I. Underline I. Will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax. Eat. Drink. Be merry. I'm about to say something that's probably going to rock your world. There is no such thing as social security in Jesus Christ. God is not against you saving and taking care of yourself. That's not what he's saying. 
He's saying, but if you're waiting for the day when you can sort of sit back and then relax, okay, hang on. Oh, please come back next Sunday. <laughs> Many of our adults are walking libraries of wisdom and service. And because sometimes they think we emphasize children and students a lot, they think that they don't have a place here. Are you kidding me? Can I just say that maybe in the tone that Jesus might say it? Your place as an adult and an older adult, no matter your life stage, is valuable. You are needed here to serve and to be a model of serving of ministry. Just because you may not have children, just because you may not be married, just because you might be in the Social Security age range does not mean culture does not tell you to stop serving Jesus Christ. There is no such thing as Social Security. There is no such thing as retirement in Christ. You serve Him until the last day you take your breath on earth, and then you're in glory, and then you get to realize why you served Christ. You, you and I, as older adults, are called to be Titus believers, where the older women are to put into the younger women, where the older men are to put into the younger men. If you, as an older person, are not pouring into somebody, you're not where you need to be in Christ. And you need to be the first one to come up to the altar today. <laughs> Wow, I called you out on that one. But I'm serious. We, I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I've done church long enough, not too long, but I've done it long enough to know that after a while of emphasis on students and children, you begin to hear older adults say, what about us? Your role is to help teach and train and model behavior for those younger adults and younger children. That is your role. That is your job. And the Bible is basically telling you and I that. He says, you don't reach an age where you say, I've reached a moment where I can eat, relax, drink, and be merry. Because what does God say? If you didn't get his warning in the beginning, you're going to miss the warning in the end. But God said to him, fool. Interesting. That phrase, be on guard, is spelled in the Greek P-H-Y-L-O-U-S-A-S, -S, I believe. Don't correct me on that. But it's basically pronounced phulos. So he begins with, if you're not aware, you will be made a fool. And if you follow a path that you weren't aware Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? You do not want to get to the end of your life and think you prepared in this earth only to realize that everything that you thought you were prepared for, you were absolutely unprepared for eternity, which is the biggest thing. And that's why he uses two different words for beware. Take care, beware, and be on guard. Jesus is strongly teaching here on an area of generosity. And he says, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself, is he not rich toward God? That's where you want to be. That's where you want to be. So let me show you five mistakes of the parable of this foolish farmer. Five mistakes that he made that you and I, Jesus said, we need to avoid. Okay? Okay. Why, what do you and I need to avoid? What should be our mindset towards generosity, towards possessions, and towards goods? Number one, when Jesus taught this, he said the farmer failed to recognize his assets had potential value for others. In other words, it's just what I just said. You and I never reach a point where we feel like I can retire in ministry. I can retire in serving. Remember this. What you do pays your bills, but who you are is a minister in Jesus Christ. When you get to heaven, God is not going to be interested if you earned employee of the month. What he's going to be interested in, what did you do with what I gave you at the moment? You and I are, are only guaranteed a day, and we're not even guaranteed that every, every second of that day. But you and I are only guaranteed our daily bread. And every day we need to wake up and say, yes, God, I have to go to work, and I have to earn a living, and I have to do these things. I get that. Like you teach industry, like hard work in the Bible. That ethic is taught in the Word of God. But you also teach that everything I am doing is working for your kingdom and not my kingdom. The number one mistake that he made was he failed to realize everything that he had had value not for him but for others. In other words, what does he do? This, this man says, what I'm going to do is I have so much, I need to build a bigger barn to put more of my stuff in. Instead of realizing, in other words, he took retirement. He put everything in a shelter. He put everything in a shed. Instead of as God gave, he gave away. As God gave, he gave away. He put a fence around it. He began to hog. He began to hoard. He began to hold on to. And the more he acquired, the bigger barn that he built. 
The Bible tells you and I, we need to realize our assets have value for others. The reason why God gives you what he gives you is not just for you. It's always for others. The Bible tells us that. Somebody said this, an idle field not fertilized is useless. An idle machine not used is rust. An idle muscle not exercised is soft. And an idle mind is the devil's workshop. You and I are to constantly be employed and use it everything we have for the kingdom of Christ. If we're not, then we're idle. And idle things don't work so well. Why? Because there's a direct correlation. Listen, you will find this in the scriptures every time. There's a direct correlation between laying our gifts aside and sliding spiritually. We call that backsliding. There's a direct correlation... For when you and I are not serving, we begin to slide spiritually where we are. I've seen it. I'm telling you. I've seen it. Cameraman, do you mind following me for just a moment? I'm going to go in the dark. I have seen it. I have, can I do this? I pray I can do this. I don't know if I can do this or not. Broadcast family, bear with us. I, I literally have watched it. Perry, I'm going to stand here beside you, but not because you're the illustration, right? So I, I literally have watched people. I've watched people come into church, and this is where they normally start, somewhere in the back, somewhere that's safe, right? Well, this is a really different view. Um, I'm usually looking the other way. You guys are a good-looking crowd out here. I can see y'all now. I, I, li- I literally watch people. They, they'll, they'll come into the church, and they'll say, how can I serve? And there's Tim, and they'll walk up, and they'll start serving. Tim really started serving. Of course, there's Rodney moving all up. Like, I get it. Here's Eric and her friends. Like, they, they occupy these rows over here. Like, we just keep moving up, and they serve. They serve. They just keep serving. And before you know it, they're up here in the reserved serving section, like, right? The, these are the people that are close to the Mount of Olives that when the rapture happens, they're going up first. The backseat Baptist, Judy says amen. Even for a Philadelphia eagle, she's going to fly fast. Moving on. Moving on, moving on, moving on, moving on, right? If Perry's going to move up. <laughs> I love that. Oh, my gosh, I love that. But now watch. Thank you for letting me be different this Sunday morning. Now watch. They'll move up, and they'll move up, and they'll move up. And then after a while, for whatever reason, life does what life does, spiritual warfare, the head, the mind. Like so many things start, can I say the word jack up? Like start jacking up your head and your emotions. And then all of a sudden, this view up front is no longer just a view up front. It becomes a very small, minimalistic view. Now follow me. And after a while, you forget all the people that were behind you that when you first came here, you were looking at the backs of their head. You were wondering, who are they? Now you know some of them. Now that you're sort of isolated and you're serving, you begin to say things like, nobody knows my name. Nobody knew it was my birthday. People began to forget about me. I wasn't greeted when I came in. I've been locked up in the children's room for a long time now. Nobody came to get me for four or five hours. Like all those things start to happen in your head. And you know what happens? Doug, you don't have to move. <laughs> don't move. Well, what happens is they begin to, they begin to move back. And I'm t- the next Sunday, I'll see them two rows back. Then the next five, four or five Sundays, I'll see them, hey, Jim, not you. I'll see, them, I'll see them five or six rows back. I'm just telling you, I've watched it for 35 years. They'll move back to here. They'll move back to here. Then they'll be talking to people in the lobby. And then after a while, when they're talking to people in the lobby, they'll fill up their cup and not even come into church and get their coffee. Then they'll be in their car. Six weeks later... I'll be asking the staff, hey, have you seen so-and-so? Well, just four weeks ago, they were in the middle. Now they're in the back. Last time I saw them was in the parking lot. I think I saw their car leaving. I'm just telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. If there's one thing I know about church, I know that happens. I'm te- because what happens? You begin to get this isolated view of how the church should meet your needs rather than how you are a part of a body to help meet the body's needs. And the devil will cause you to slide spiritually every time. And I'm telling you, I'll send you a text. And you, I can, you'll already know how to respond. Like, go ahead and put this in your notes. You'll know how to respond to me. Like, I will send you a text. Hey, I've been praying for you today. You're on my prayer list. I've been missing you. Usually about 12 hours later. Thank you, Pastor Ron, for texting me. It's been a little bit of a rough season. My wife and I think we're moving on. Then I'll respond back. I'd love to hear more, but not over text. Can we get together? No, that's all right. The Lord has moved in this area, and we're just, I'm just telling you, it happens. Now, some of that's natural. I get that. Growth is natural, and and when we all grow, some of us grow apart. Some of us grow with. Some of us grow separate. I get that, that that happens. Here's the point I'm trying to make. 
The reason why you and I have to get out and serve is so the devil doesn't mess with our view where we're sitting and we think it's all about us rather than all about others. The reason why you come to church, and I'm going to say this again, I'm probably going to jack you up three times on a Sunday. I'm telling you right now, the number one reason why you come to church is to not get your needs met. That is not, that is not the number one reason why you come to church is to get your needs met. You know, wait, 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 Pastor Ron, I thought that. No. The number one reason why you come to church is to get close to Christ. So that when you get close to Christ, whatever is disoriented in your head and your brain gets reoriented by worship and reoriented by the Word of God. So the Word of God can reset your meter because we're all selfish people. Everybody in here wears two name tags, an invisible name tag of your name. You want people to notice you. And number two, your needs, your name and your needs. You come in here, notice my name and notice that I have a need. And when you feel like the church doesn't, doesn't value either one of those, you start slowly backing out. Now, what happens when you start meeting other people's needs, you actually get your needs met. You actually get your needs met. But if you're coming here this morning and you're wanting to draw a social security check of Christ's likeness and not serve, that cash will not check. Or that check will not cash. <laughs> that one. I rethought it. <laughs> Thank you. For... <laughs> okay, we did it right. Anyway, maybe I should say that. Venmo won't Venmo because who writes checks and cash? I don't know, whatever. Do you understand my point? What you have been given is not for you to acquire. What you have been given is so you can give away to others. And the moment you fail to recognize that, you're sliding spiritually. You should know that. Here's the lesson. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. It's simply stated. I know you've heard that before. If you don't use it, You'll lose it. Number two, the farmer failed to recognize, listen, that major decisions need God's guidance. There's a reason why I emphasized how many personal pronouns he used. Here's why. When, they, when you have too many personal pronouns in your future, you can be sure that God has no part in it. Pay attention to that. When you have too many personal pronouns in your future... You can bet that God has no part. Why? You're not consulting God at that moment. You're not asking him. You're not inquiring of him. You're not looking toward him. You literally said, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, and I will. Here's the lesson. We need God's guidance even when things are going well. Even when things are going well, you and I still have to look to Christ now, again, the Bible never told this man to denounce his riches, just like we told last Sunday. It was that he did not realize how to use what God had given him. God is not against you having things, right? Money is not evil. It's the love of money that is evil, right? You have got to understand that. We have to have an appropriate biblical view of how to use what God has given us. Lesson number three, the farmer failed to recognize he can make a lasting contribution to the kingdom of God. I venture to say, if I were to put a number on it, probably at least 80% of people that attend church fall into this number. And it probably would be higher. But I didn't want to be too overwhelmingly negative. But the average church attender fails to realize that they, they, you, can make a difference in the kingdom of God. Which is why we only attend on Sunday morning. And we never give, or we never serve, or we never go, or we never pray, or we never worship. You see, many believers have received Christ, but very few have delivered Christ to somebody else in some form or fashion. You're here for a reason, and it's so much more than just to get your needs met. God will meet your needs. Don't misunderstand me. He will meet your needs, but only when you get your eyes off of you and get your eyes on Him and let God attract you to others. That's how your need is met. But you have to understand this. You can make a lasting contribution to the kingdom of God. Most of the things that we are spending time acquiring, we're going to leave behind. And they're going to be useless. Even if they are left behind for a season, they're still going to be left behind no matter how many generations behind us. But what we don't want is we don't want to leave things to generations that don't follow us to Christ. We want to leave with the generations, generations coming after us because they followed Christ. The only thing that's going to follow you to heaven are those you've invited with you. That includes your family. And the Bible tells you now you can make 
a, a co lasting contribution to the kingdom of God. In other words, this man was goods-centered, not God-centered. He didn't realize that. What's the lesson? Give and live with an eternal mindset. You were made for eternity. The book of Ecclesiastes, the wisest man in the world, wrote some of the strongest, wisest literature ever written, tells you in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that he, God, has placed eternity in our hearts. In other words, if you were to just wipe the slate clean on earth, right? If you, if you could be Thanos and just start things over, right? If you, could do, if you could start the world over, do you realize seconds after the world restarted, we'd be right back where we were? Because we are separated, we are lost without Christ, and we understand we are absolutely in desperate need of Christ. And seconds after the world has some sort of a restart, the human heart will begin to ask, Why am I here? What is my purpose? For why do I exist? Who made me? Because the Bible says God has placed eternity in your hearts. He hasn't placed temporary. He hasn't placed earthly. He has placed eternity so you and I must therefore begin to live with that mindset. Number four, the farmer failed to recognize that his soul is more valuable than his goods. We know that. We know that. Like right now, you're quoting that verse. You know that. But the farmer failed to recognize that his soul was more valuable. In, in, in other words, we gather our identity we gather our identity from things we acquire. We gather identity from maybe titles that we have at work. And certain, like working and acquiring things, God's not against that. But when, as someone has said, when our net worth begins to define our self-worth, when our possessions begin to define our purpose and so forth, then that's where we make the mistake. And this is exactly what this farmer did. So what's the lesson? You have to learn how to look beyond yourselves and see what God can do. Most of us only live with a, a temporary view. We live with, thank God it's Friday. Like we live with a five-day view. Like if, and I get it. Sometimes the work weeks and your job, you may not like it. You may not like the boss. You may not like the situation. You may not like the ethics. It may just be a job. Like I get that. Like not many of us, if you will, enjoy every day and enjoy our job and everything about it. Like I understand that life's going to do what life does to us. But the Bible is telling you now, we have to understand, we have to understand this, that our soul is more valuable than anything we could ever acquire. And what you and I are called to do is invest in that by getting close to God, by growing with God, by saying, God, show me today things that I cannot see, but I should see. That's why he said, take care and be on guard. Take care and be on guard. He literally said, I need you to see what the eye needs to see so the mind can readjust so that you're not guided along a path that you should not go that will snatch you away and will be hard to come back. You need to live with a mindset that is eternal, but live with a mindset that looks beyond yourselves. And say, God, what can you do with these things? What can you do with my hands? What can you do with my heart? Why have you gifted me this way? Why have you shaped me this way? What do you want to do with me now? And look beyond yourselves. See this man, we know this. He didn't take care of his soul. We know that, which is why Jesus is so strong when he says, fool. That's a strong word. Tonight, your soul is required of you. He prepared more for his goods than he did his faith. And at the end, how many funerals have I sat at? And, and I always, not really dread, but they're not the easiest thing to do. When I begin to hear that the funeral I'm about to do, the family sort of left behind an inheritance. And you, they tell me, Pastor, you need to be aware of who might show up. Like I always hear, like, who might show up? Like we haven't seen so-and-so in 35 years, and now that the father has passed away, he's coming back, and he wants the Rolex watch and the golf clubs. You know what I mean? Like he hasn't talked to my dad in 35 years. You need to be aware of what might happen. Like how many times have I seen people fight over possessions that are left behind? You and I don't want to live like that. That's not really what we want to live behind. What Jesus is trying to say to him, prepare for your death more than you prepare for your goods to be stored somewhere. Here's the last lesson. The farmer failed to recognize that worldly wealth is not spiritual wealth. Listen to this. The farmer failed to recognize that worldly wealth is not spiritual wealth. 
In other words, if you go back to the story, that's what he says over and over and over. Like, I stored these things. I acquired these things. I've put them aside. Now I can sit back and I can relax. Instead of asking God, what can you do with all of this? He said, I'm just going to sit back on a rocking chair right in front of all the barns that are full of all the stuff that I have, and I'm just going to sit there and just do what? I mean, like, think about that. He failed to recognize that worldly wealth is not the same as spiritual wealth. If we're not careful, our tendency is to trust in possessions more than we trust in God. Is to trust in our possessions more than we absolutely trust in God. So what's the lesson? When you lose yourself in serving God, you actually will find yourself a wealthy person. Because now you have your eyes off the things of this world and the heart no longer goes down a path that is distracting and potentially divisive and causes you and I to wonder, like, how should I now balance these things? When you lose yourself in serving God, then you discover how absolutely wealthy you are. Jesus said it best. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own? Listen to what he says to him. He literally says, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Where are you on the meter? Where are you on the meter of possessions? Where are you on the meter of purpose? Where are you in, on the meter of serving? Like, where is the balance? Once again, let me say this. Jesus is basically saying to this man, I, Jesus, did not come to bring man to money. I came to bring man to God. And that's a story he repeats over and over and over. How odd would that have been to have been in a crowded situation to follow the Savior? And one man interrupt and sort of demand, give me a legal opinion. And then Jesus turns and now no longer addresses him, but answers the question. And the Bible says he talked to them in a parable. And said, what are you going to do with your possessions? What place will they take? And so I'm asking you a question Jesus has already asked. What are you going to do with what God gave you? Right now, would you say no matter what age you are, are you sort of drawing social security on Christ? Like you're sort of just drawing on a weekly payment or a monthly payment, monthly installments just to bare minimum get by? Do you already consider yourself sort of retired? Like, well, when I get this paycheck, when I get this job, when I understand this, then I'll serve God. Don't be a fool that all of a sudden wakes up and realizes tonight your soul is required of you. Every day, you and I are supposed to wake up and say, God, today's your day. This is your day. You made it. And you've given me daily bread. And I will use everything you've given me to bring glory and honor to you. Because I want to be found responsible as a steward to the one who owns me and has given me everything. Don't make these same mistakes. Take care. Be on guard. Because greed will take you down a path that will never satisfy, but can get you lost. Let's not go there. Amen?